Hi, and welcome back to Seal of the Living God Ministry. My name is Benny, and really happy to see you come back and study with us today. Just as a reminder, Seal of the Living God Ministry is a Bible-based Bible study ministry. So our intention is to share the gospel, the word of God, but do so with the word and the word alone. In Matthew 4, 4, Jesus says, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So the intention or the direction of this ministry is to share the word of God solely as we build doctrine. Because nowadays there's a lot of opinions, there's a lot of uh, traditions in what people teach, and a lot of people don't really know what they believe. So the intention again is to share what the Bible teaches directly from the word as found in Christ Jesus. So with that being said, uh, my intention today is to share what is the gospel. I'm going to repeat that one more time. What is the gospel? And the reason why I want to share that is because I feel that sometimes that word gospel is thrown out very loosely and we don't understand the gravity or the depth of what the gospel really is. So I'm going to try my best to share it as God has revealed it to me and I hope it is a blessing to you as it is for me. So with that being said, if you would please reverently bow your head with me. Our Father and our God, Holy, holy, holy is thy glorious and precious name. I thank you, Father, for your loving kindness towards us and your mercy. I thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit and I ask for a special blessing upon me and upon any viewer who is watching this um, study as we speak now, Father. Uh, please, Father, help us understand thy word. Help us understand the gospel message, Father, for it is salvation for us. Please impress our minds and hearts and help us, Father, be drawn closer to Christ, for Christ is our salvation. Please, Father, lead this study out that it may be to your praise, honor, and glory. I pray and ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen, Father, and amen. So again, we said we're going to look at uh, a lot of Bible verses, as many as I can share with you today. We're not going to cover everything because this is actually a study that will go on forever and ever and ever into the eternity. There's so much to this study that we're not going to be able to cover here. I'm just going to try my best to give you a summary of it. So with that being said, Let's, share, let's see what the Bible teaches about the gospel and the outcome of the true gospel. So turn with me to Matthew, Matthew 24, if you turn with me, Matthew, the 24th chapter, and what we're going to look at is Matthew 24, verse 14, Matthew 24, verse 14, and when you're there, please say Amen. So it looks to me here, let's see, I'm reading the King James Version, and my version says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So we're looking here is that the Bible gospel, the true gospel, is a gospel that is going to produce something. And if you notice that Jesus doesn't say, and a gospel shall be preached, he says, and this gospel, he's being very specific because he knows that there are going to be other gospels being preached. So Jesus says, and this gospel, a very specific gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. So this is a gospel that's going to be worldwide and will serve as a witness to all nations. And out of this true gospel message, the outcome will be, then shall the end come. So that is the true gospel. The gospel message, once it is preached with power the way it should be, should lead towards the end of the world and obviously the end of the world meaning that Jesus will come back to receive his people. God willing, I will be a part of that group and you and you you also, God willing, will be a part of it. So this is the true gospel we're looking for. But the Bible also teaches about false gospels and we have to be very, very careful. I've mentioned this in previous videos that Satan is a counterfeiter. So he tries to duplicate the true with the false and the true and the false are very similar to one another but you have to be a very astute student to recognize the false from the true. So it's just like um, uh, counterfeit money. If you are someone who is in a bank and you deal with money day in and day out, if I hand you a fake $100 bill, you'll be able to tell it's fake. But if you don't have that intimate relationship with, that, um, with currency, with handling a lot of cash, it might be difficult for you to distinguish the true from the fake. So we really need to study God's word and understand. In James uh, 1, 5, it says, uh, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, to give it to all men liberally, and it breaketh not, and it shall be given him. So we need to pray to God, even now, that he gives us wisdom and an understanding of his word, so we may not be deceived to believe a lie. So with that being said, let's go to Galatians. 
Galatians. Galatians is in the New Testament, and Paul wrote this, Galatians chapter 1, and that's right after the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and then we get to the book of Galatians. So turn with me to Galatians chapter 1, and we're going to look at two verses, Galatians 1 verse 6 and then 7. Galatians 1 verse 6 and then 7, and let's see if there's another gospel that's going to be preached. Hopefully this is not the one that you and I accept. It says here, uh, verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So this is not the gospel that Jesus is talking about. This is another gospel. Look at verse 7. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And then verse 8, let's read there also. It says, but though we from an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which have been preached unto you, let him be a curse. So Paul here is saying, hey, you know which gospel I preach to you is a very specific gospel. It is the same gospel that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, 14. And here he's saying, if somebody else comes to you with a different gospel, he said, don't receive it because whoever receives it will be accursed. So we have to be very, very careful because there will be false gospels. Let me give you another witness. Go to the book of 2 Corinthians. It's right before the book of Galatians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And let's look at verses 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. It says here in verse 3, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind shall be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So Paul is here talking again about what? Another Christ, another gospel, another spirit. So these are not the spirits from Christ. These are false spirits. These are false gospels. And we know this is false because this chapter is actually ultimately going to point to Satan. When you get down to verse 14, I had shared this verse with you guys before. I believe in the study called, Who is Satan? Look at verse 14. It says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Verse 15 says, Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And I skip verse 13. Verse 13 says, For such are false apostles. So this chapter is talking about false apostles, a false Christ, which will be Satan, impersonating Jesus himself, and speaking about a false Christ and a false gospel. So now we saw there are two. There are what? Two, at least two. It's talking about a true gospel and a false gospel. And the, the, what we have to be very careful is when you want to speak about the truth, the true gospel will produce a very specific outcome, but it can only be one gospel. When something is true, it can only be one. But the false gospel can be infinite. So I'll give you an example. If I were to tell you 2 plus 2 equals 4, the only answer is what? 4, right? 2 plus 2 equals 4. But if I told you a wrong answer, I said 2 plus 2 equals 1. 2 plus 2 equals a million. 2 plus 2 equals a thousand. How many false answers could I come up with? The answer is an infinite amount. So when we're talking about error, there is a vast, vast number of options for error. Whereas when we speak of truth, there's only one true gospel. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to try to look at a description of the true gospel as best we can. And I'm going to ask you to please prayerfully consider what we're going to go over. Look at 1 Corinthians, the book before. We're going to go to chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And let's start with verse 1. We're going to go to 1 through 4, and then we're going to read carefully thereafter. So let's read it first, and then I want to read very carefully with you. In verse 1 it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, 
if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day unto the, to the Scriptures. Amen? So that's verse 1 through 4. But now let's look very carefully, and I want you to have an astute eye. Remember Isaiah chapter 1 verse, 10, four, uh, 1 verse 18, it says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. So the Lord wants us to reason with our minds. So I'm asking you now to please reason with me and let's study a little bit more carefully. Look at verse 1 again. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the what? The gospel which I preached. So the central aspect of this set of verses we're looking at is the gospel. And it is the gospel that Paul preached. I'm emphasizing that because it's going to come up later on. It's going to be very important that you don't lose it. So Paul is talking about what? The gospel which he preached. Amen? Now let's continue reading. And it says, which also ye have received. So it says, it's a message that he preached and the brethren from Corinth have received this gospel and where ye stand. In other words, they are grounded. This is their foundation. Amen? Verse 2. By which, what's by which? That same gospel message, right? Because that is the context. Remember what I had shared in a previous study. Text without context is pretext. We can't take a Bible verse out of the context. The context being spoken here is the gospel, which Paul preached, which established their faith, we'll see. And verse 2 says, which also ye are saved. So again, the gospel which was preached is what saved these people and Paul himself. And it continues saying, if, that's a condition, if you keep in memory, in other words, if we keep it in our minds, what I preached, what did he preach? The gospel, right? Remember, I keep emphasizing the word preached. He preached the gospel in verse 1. And it continues saying, unto you, unless you have believed in vain. So Paul's saying that I preached to you a very specific gospel, that gospel is what saves us, and if you don't believe, it's in vain. So, in other words, it's without purpose. If you don't believe what he's sharing, the outcome that you should benefit from will not benefit you because you're not believing it. Look at verse 3. For I delivered... So what's another word for delivered? So I'm going to share with you that word delivered can also say verbally delivered. So what's verbally delivered in the context we're reading? Another word we could put there is the word preached. So when he says delivered, he's still talking about a verbal deliverance. And it says, so I can actually replace the word delivered to the word preach. It says, for I delivered or preached unto you first all that which I also received. So Paul's saying, I'm not sharing anything with you that I didn't receive myself. And again, what's the centrality here? The gospel. What about the gospel? He preached the gospel. The gospel produced something. Salvation improved. It says in verse 2, that by which you are saved. It, ground, it provides a foundation of our faith that we have to believe or else we are going to believe in vain, which means without purpose. Verse 3 continues saying, now it's going to get to the middle of it. It's going to say, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So this gospel that was preached, the end result is salvation, our foundation of our faith. And this is stating that that gospel is how that Christ died die for our sins, your sins and mine, according to the scriptures. Because Jesus had to die. It was necessary because his whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation is one central figure. The central figure is Christ Jesus. Jesus is in every single book of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. The problem is that a lot of Christians think that Jesus comes into the scene in the New Testament. But they are confused. Jesus is eternal. Remember we had done that study, um, who is our creator? We have found that Jesus is our creator. And not only is Jesus our creator, he is also our sustainer. And he is also eternal. He is the Alpha and the Omega. We read that in the book of um, uh, Revelation, it spoke of that. Uh, and we repeatedly saw how Jesus was eternal. He was the creator over and over and over. If you have not studied that, I would strongly recommend you watch it because it's very important and it kind of segues right into what we're studying now. 
So it's saying here that the salvation we have, or the gospel preached, is Jesus. Uh, he was he died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then verse four says, and that he, speaking of Christ, was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So Jesus had to die, and he was buried. And as a matter of fact, if you go to verse, uh, let's go to verse. 11. Let's continue reading. So now we see how Jesus is the gospel because it says that um, Paul preached the gospel and that this gospel was what saved us and eventually said that Christ saved us from our sins. Amen? And it continues saying in verse 11, Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, again that word preach, and so ye believed. So he's saying this true preaching of the gospel should be accompanied by belief or faith. That should come there. And look at verse 12, and this is one I want you to pay attention. It says, now if Christ be preached, so now Paul first started with, if the gospel I preached to you, that's what he said, right? He goes, the gospel I preached in verse one. Correct me if I'm wrong. He says, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached. That's verse one. Now he's segueing. And instead of saying the word gospel, now he's saying in verse 12, now if Christ be preached. So is the central figure changed yet? No, it's still the gospel. But now instead of using the word gospel, Paul is saying Christ. That's very important. We're going to get back to that. It says, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So this is another testimony. Remember we had studied what happens when you die? Look what it continues saying in verse 13. Not to get deterred, but look what it says. It says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain? And your faith is also in vain. Verse 15 says, yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he raised not up, if so, be that the dead rise now. So what Paul is saying is that in the same way that Jesus rose after he died, that is the promise that you and I need to claim. Because when you die, you don't go to heaven or hell. We had studied that at nauseam. We had studied that exhaustively. So the, the central uh, figure of what we're going over now is not that aspect. It's the aspect of the gospel. So let's kind of summarize what Paul was saying here. He's saying first, he preached to us the gospel, correct? He then says that this gospel was received. It was also the stands, the foundation in verse 1. Then he talks about it being in our memory and that we have to hold down to this because if we don't hold down to it, then our faith is without purpose, it's vain, without its vain worship. It continues saying, verse 3, it said that he transitioned. He says, for I delivered to you what he received, which is the true gospel, and he says how that Christ died for our sins. So he's still speaking about the gospel and the gospel is about Christ and how he died for our sins. So the gospel message is the good news. We've heard that, right? Uh, in, in Spanish, we said evangelio, the, uh, which means evan the uh, evangel. evangel. <laughs> so we're, we're speaking about the gospel message, which is good news. Why is it good news? Because we are condemned to death. But thank God, praise God and praise Christ, that Christ came to pay the price of sin for you and for me. And it says that he paid, he died for our sins according to the scriptures. And now when we jump down to verse 12, it says, instead of it saying again, I want to keep emphasizing this, the gospel, it says, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead. So now he's saying that the gospel and Christ are what? One and the same. Okay, let me repeat what I just said. Christ and the gospel, or better yet, the gospel and Christ are one and the same. That's very important that we understand, understand that because Christ is our salvation. Christ's perfect life, his perfect death, his perfect resurrection, his sinlessness, how he ascended after he was resurrected from his dead. That is our salvation. That is our promise. That is our gift to eternal life. And if we don't hold on to Christ, we are not blessed to receive that. So the gospel and Christ are one and the same. So I'm going to take it one step further. If the gospel and Christ are one and the same, then remember how I said that Christ 
is eternal. Do you remember I said that? Christ is eternal. And the scriptures point to that explicitly. So now let me post something to you. If Christ and the gospel are one and the same, and if Christ is eternal, then by default, the gospel must be eternal. Correct me if I'm wrong. Let me state that one more time. If Christ is eternal, amen, and we study that, and the gospel and Christ are one and the same, because Paul says that he preached the gospel, and then he did what? Preach Christ. So Christ is eternal, the gospel and Christ are one and the same, that means the gospel is also eternal. Amen? So this is very critical. The reason why this is so important is because we have to understand that the plan of salvation did not start at Calvary. So now I want to share with you a few verses to show you that the Bible teaches that the gospel is eternal. Look with me to Revelation. Look at Revelation, and this is extremely important because sin did not catch God by surprise. God is eternal. He lives outside of time. As a matter of fact, remember we had studied that Jesus says that, that he referenced himself as I am when he was speaking to the Pharisees. And when he said that I am, he was referencing to himself when he spoke to Moses in uh, Exodus chapter 3. He's, Moses asked, who shall I say sent me? And God, who was Jesus, said, S tell the people that I am that I am has sent you. That word I am means the self-existent one. So Christ is eternal. Christ and the gospel are one and the same because Paul used them in that context in 1 Corinthians 15. And I'm sharing with you that not only is Christ eternal, but so is the gospel eternal. Now look at Revelation 14. Revelation 14, let's let the Bible explain it. Remember what we read Matthew 4.4 4 says, Jesus says, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So look at Revelation chapter 14. This is an incredible chapter, by the way. Revelation 14. And let's read verse 6. Revelation 14, verse 6. It says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So this is a gospel message that has to be preached to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Remember how in Matthew 24 verse, um, uh, Matthew 24 verse 14, it talked about, and this gospel shall be preached unto all the earth. So now we're talking about that same gospel, the true gospel, the one that Jesus spoke of. It says here, and I saw another angel find the mist, uh, mist of heaven having the everlasting gospel. The gospel is everlasting. What's, in, what's an interesting is that this word in the Greek everlasting means without beginning and without end. Let me repeat that. The word everlasting, if you look at the coin Greek, which is the ori original language, that word means without beginning and without end. Remember, we also studied Jesus had no beginning and he has no end. He was the Alpha and the Omega. He is the great I Am who exists outside of time. So the gospel message is eternal as Jesus is eternal. Let me give you another witness. Let's go to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And... Let's start in verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. It says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your father. Remember, this has to do with redemption. Redemption comes through Christ alone. Look at verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Let me stop there. In John chapter 1 verse 29, the Bible says, John the Baptist is speaking. He says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the earth. So he says what? Behold the Lamb of God. So here in verse 19, John is describing Jesus here, it's also describing Jesus in verse 19. It says, but with the precious blood of who? Christ, as of a lamb, because remember that's his name, the Lamb of God, 
without blemish and without spot. Verse 20, this is the key verse, look what it says. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you and for me. Verse 21, who by him do we believe in God that raised him up from the dead, you see it has the same verbiage from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. So God is sharing with us here that Jesus was foreordained. Look at verse 20. This gospel message, this salvation message, because verse 19 is talking about how we were redeemed, how we're saved in the blood of Christ. Verse 20 says that this salvation was, it says, who verily was foreordained. Foreordained means was uh, predetermined beforehand, before what? The foundation of the world. So this gospel message, this message of salvation is an eternal one even before the foundation of the world. So the Bible teaches, as I showed you in Revelation 14 verse 6, that the gospel is an everlasting gospel. And here we're saying, uh, being shown also by Peter, another witness, that the gospel, which is redemption through what? The blood of Christ, the Lamb of God, is what? eternal because it was ordained or it was set in place before the foundation of the world. Does that make sense? Amen? So now that we saw that the gospel is eternal, that it's shown in Revelation 14 and also here in 1 Peter 1, now let's go and see what type of power does this gospel message have. This is not a weak gospel message, this is a message for salvation. So let's go into the book of Romans. Go to the book of Romans, turn with me to Romans, we're going to go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, Romans is right after the book of Acts, Romans 1. And we're going to look at verse 16 and 17. And again, we're still speaking about the gospel. I just shared with you that the gospel and Christ are one and the same. The gospel is salvation through Christ, through his blood, through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, that through his uh, sacrifice for us, those who believe in him and trust in him can have salvation. But I'm also sharing with you that as Christ is eternal, so is the gospel. The gospel is also eternal. And now I'm sharing with you that the gospel has power, not weak power, power to the uttermost. So let's look at that right now. Let's look at Romans 1 verse 16. Amen? It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is what? The power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So we're seeing here in verse 16, Paul speaking again, he's saying that he is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You see how Paul is tying the gospel and Christ together? Because in 1 Corinthians 15, we saw that when Paul said, I preached the gospel unto you, and then later on he says, Christ is preached unto you. In Paul's mind, he knows that the gospel and Christ are one and the same. But now look at the power. It says, for this gospel of Christ is what? The power of God unto salvation. So the gospel produces salvation. But salvation for who? To everyone? It's afforded to everybody, but there has to be a commitment from us. It says, continue saying, to everyone that what? Believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. So we have to see that here, the Bible is teaching us that the gospel of Christ is power from God, and that power works to what? Save not everyone, but those who believe in Christ, whether you be Jew at this time or you be a Gentile, means a non-believer. We are all Gentiles now. So we are blessed because this gospel message is a message of power. But now I have to ask you a question. Where is the source of this power? Isn't that a good question? So we know it is Christ, but let's really dig a little bit deeper. Where is the source? Where can we go to if we want to hold on and receive this power and to be saved? And where we're weakened, we can turn to this power that's being spoken of here. This gospel power of Christ, which is preached and which is 
uh, bring salvation unto us the, for those of us that believe. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is a verse, um, and this is a study, by the way, that blows me away every time I read it. And this is the centrality of our salvation, and this is the centrality of the power that God has to save us. So turn with me again to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and let's look at verse 17 and 18. Again, we just read in Romans 1 that it said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. But now let's see how Paul describes this power. And let's see if this all fits together. Amen? Look at verse 17. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17, it says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to do what? But to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. Okay, let's keep reading. Verse 18. For the preaching of the cross, you see how Paul uses the word preaching again? For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So let's digest this a little bit because this is very powerful. Verse 17 again, let's read it one more time. For Christ sent me not to baptize. Not that Paul didn't baptize, but he's saying, I'm going to share with you the centrality, the most important thing I can share with you. He says, but to preach the gospel. So Paul is preaching the gospel. And we have shared that the gospel is salvation in Christ through since he paid for our sins through his blood and it is power. But look what he continues saying is the preaching the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So what Paul is saying is that he shouldn't use his words to preach the gospel because by using his words, he's lessening the power of the cross because he says, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect, should be lowered. And I'm going to prove that right now. Look at verse 18. Remember he said that he is what? Preaching the gospel. Now he's saying what? For the preaching of the cross. So let's, now let's stop there. I first share with you that Paul was preaching the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. Then in 1 Corinthians 15, he said that he is preaching Christ. And I had shared with you that in preaching Christ, he's also preaching the gospel because they're one and the same. I also share with you that that gospel message is an eternal message. And now Paul is saying that he's preaching the cross. So the cross and the gospel and Christ are all one and the same because they all have the power. What type of power? It says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Those who don't want to listen to the gospel will be perishing, sadly. Hopefully that is not you and me, brothers and sisters. They continue saying, but unto us which are saved. So Paul is saying emphatically, I am saved because why? I claim the gospel promise. I claim that power which leads unto salvation. He says, but we, unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And remember Paul said in Romans 1 verse 16, he, he said that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power. So let's summarize all these verses. I went through a lot of verses and I was going back and forth. And I hope you were uh, paying attention and prayerfully considering what I was sharing. The gospel of Christ is the good news. Praise God. It is not just the good news uh, in, on the surface in a, a very shallow way. In a deeper way, we saw that when Paul said he was preaching the gospel, he was preaching how that leads to salvation, that is this foundation of our faith that we have to hold on to with faith because Christ came to pay for our sins, for your sins and mine. And then later on in that same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, he says that he was preaching Christ. So he was still talking about the gospel, now he's speaking about Christ. He spoke about, um, uh, in, in um, Romans, he spoke about Christ having, uh, the gospel of Christ being power unto salvation. And now we're seeing that that power is centralized in Christ and more specifically in the cross of Christ. So when you and I feel weakened, when we feel that sin is overtaking us, when we feel that we're not capable, praise God, in our weakness, what you and I should do is we should go to the cross of Christ. We should look for Christ in the cross. 
We should behold him suffering for our sins. We should behold him suffering in Gethsemane, uh, bleeding, um, sweat, drops of blood coming out of his, 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 um, his forehead because he was suffering because he was paying the price of sin for you and me. This gospel message is also an eternal message. We saw that in Revelation 14, verse 6, it said that the everlasting gospel, which had, means no beginning and no end. The gospel is not something that God thought of last minute when Adam and Eve sinned. Let me say that again. God was not surprised when Adam and Eve sinned. He already had a plan in place, which is why when we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, it says, uh, through 21, verse 20 said that, that the gospel message, which is Christ, His blood shed, shed for us, the Lamb of God without blemish, it says that that gospel was foreordained or was established before the creation of the world. So the gospel is an eternal one. And I'm going to share with you, brothers and sisters, that every single person that will be saved will be saved through Jesus. Okay? There's a false teaching that people think that the Old Testament, the people were saved because of their sacrifices. And because of that sacrifice of those animals, the bulls and bullocks and everything else, the lambs, the goats, the rams, that because of that they were saved. But that is not true. The purpose of those sacrifices was to point to the true sacrifice. Hear me out, brothers and sisters. Remember how I, I mentioned to you that Jesus is called the Lamb of God? We saw that in the book of John 129. I had quoted it for you. Jesus um, was coming to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. Why do you think John called Jesus the Lamb of God? Because it was a good nickname? That, that might be a reason why. Or because John knew that Jesus was the fulfillment of the sacrificial system. Jesus was the pinnacle of the sacrifice. Amen? So that when all those sacrifices were being made in the Old Testament, whether it was Adam and Eve who needed forgiveness of sins, whether it was the sacrifice that uh, Abel had offered to God in Genesis chapter 4, and, and Cain got upset because he had offered uh, the uh, first fruits of the field, not a lamb, he had offered first fruits, and that's in uh, the book of Genesis chapter 4. The sacrifice has always pointed to Jesus. No one has ever been saved because of the sacrifice of the blood of bulls and goats. Everyone has been saved because of the blood of Christ Jesus. So what I want to share with you is that the blood of Jesus has saved everyone from Genesis to Revelation. Every single person has been saved. The difference is, is that in the Old Testament, the people were looking forward to the coming Savior. And in showing their faith, they were holding on to this Messiah coming and that this Messiah would um, ultimately pay his life. His death would be paid through his shed blood and that death would pay salvation for you and I. So they were looking forward for the Messiah to come and looking forward, they were sacrificing animals in faith. In faith, they were sacrificing those animals. Now, you and I, we're not sacrificing animals anymore, but we are claiming the promise of Christ because He died for us. So instead of looking forward, we are looking back. All of us are looking in one central point. They were looking at Christ who was sacrificed on the cross. We are also looking for Christ who was sacrificed on the cross. They use animals and, and gifts and sacrifices as tokens to show that they believed in God. We, by faith, believing what Christ says, and we, our faith is exhibited by obedience to God. So I hope this study is clear. And again, this is a study that is extremely deep. So if you don't understand it all, I completely understand. This is a study that you may need to see this um, Bible study over one more time, at least one more time, because this is a study that we will study for eternity. That Jesus himself, who is God, came to this earth, as a man, 100% man, but 100% God, died the perfect death, resurrected so that you and I may have salvation and through his shed blood, that blood on Calvary that he shed for us, that is the gospel, that is Christ, that is the power of the cross, that is salvation. And that is good news. 
So with that being said, I'm closing out the study with a prayer. And I hope, brothers and sisters, that you may pray with me and reverently bow your head. Our Father and our God, holy, holy, holy is thy glorious and precious name. I thank you, Father, for your loving kindness and your mercy towards us. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you for salvation through Christ Jesus, for he is the gospel. The gospel is him. For Christ is eternal, and so is the gospel, Father. For Christ and the cross are one and the same. For he is the cross, Father. He shed his blood that we may have salvation. And as Paul has said, he is the power. He is the power unto salvation to them that believe. So, Father, may I believe. May the viewers believe. May we be saved by Jesus. May we turn away from our wicked ways, Father, from sin. May we hate sin because we see what sin did to Jesus. Help us, Father, have a hatred for sin. And please, Father, save us, I pray. Be with each and every one of us, Father, and may your spirit continue to abide in us. I pray and ask this, Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, and for his name's sake I pray. Amen, Father, and amen. Thank you once more, brothers and sisters, for joining Seal of the Living God Ministry. As a reminder, I leave our email in the description section, so if you want to email any questions, if I didn't answer any questions fully and you have something else, please um, email us, please message us. You can also put a message on the uh, comment section of YouTube. You can also like us. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up, not for me, but for God's word. Let's uplift God's word, not the messenger. The messenger can be anyone. The message is what's critical. So if you like this, please share it. Please post it on social media. Please tell your friends and family members. Tell everyone, the gospel is good news. Amen? God bless you all. Hope to see you soon.